tax household income on uh, housing costs, which could be rent, could be mortgage, and includes energy costs. It doesn't include transport, although we know that more and more people are driving until they qualify for a mortgage or to get uh, rent. And we know that um, that emphasizes people in core housing need, and I'll get to that definition in a moment, um, rather than, uh, so people who are currently uh, living in unaffordable or unsuitable homes, rather than people who are driving until they qualify. The problem is that the CMHC uses about six different definitions of affordable housing in its programs. A commonly used definition is market affordable, which means 80 or sometimes 100% of market rent, but that's not affordable for the majority of low income families that are currently um, paying 30, 50, 80% of their income on, um, on rent. Um, and the CMHC also uses an internationally used measure of housing affordability called the median multiple, which is the average home cost divided by the average income cost. Uh, in Victoria, that's about 10 times average home cost divided by average income cost. The, the traditional measure of housing affordability for home ownership is three. Is that really the right metric? Is that something that can shift in the short term? Um, that's an open question, but certainly uh, the, the point is that the CMHC uses lots of different uh, definitions of um, affordable housing. Uh, similarly, there's a definition that's used by uh, the CMHC uh, in coming up with its targets for the national housing strategy and is also used by Statistics Canada. In fact, the um, 2021 census figures for how core housing need comes out tomorrow. And that is households living in unaffordable, more than 30% of before tax income, uninhabitable or overcrowded housing who can't afford an affordable home in their area. So uninhabitable, uninhabitable means requiring major repairs, plumbing, wiring, structural, overcrowded, there's national occupancy standards. Basically, I'm gonna leave it as one bedroom per couple, although it's a little more complex than that. Now, core housing is really important. 1.7 million Canadian households are in core housing need, and that seems like a really big number. But core housing need excludes people who are homeless, who are unsheltered or in emergency shelters. It includes people without secure accommodation, including a lot of women who are hidden homeless, couch surfing in a violent relationship, living in their car. It excludes congregate housing, so people who are in long-term care or rooming houses or SRO hotels um, because of the definition of what a private dwelling is. It excludes students under the age of 35 because um, according to Statistics Canada, um, students are expected to enter a voluntary period of poverty when they become students. Whether that's still true or still a useful way to run the economy is another issue. So into this morass of um, uh, definitions of affordable housing, ways to count housing need, uh, comes the housing assessment resource tools. And the project's funded by the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation uh, through its housing supply challenge to research solutions to Canada's housing crisis. And what we're doing right now is offering or developing comprehensive equity focused solutions to all levels of government, to municipal, regional, provincial, territorial, and indeed the national government. And the goal of our project is to develop standardized, replicable, reusable, sustainable tools, along with associated public information and training to improve the quality of housing supply decision-making at all levels of government. We're working with 13 government partners. You'll see Victoria on the far left. Um, we're also uh, working with um, several of the largest uh, cities in Canada. Um, on our advisory committee, we have Vancouver, uh, Montreal, uh, and then we have um, Kelowna, for instance, on our advisory committee. Uh, but these are the 13 cities that we're currently testing at. Well, sorry, the 13 governments, includes the Yukon Territory and a couple of regions that we're currently testing the tools out in. 
we have a huge advisory committee. I'm just including it to give a sense of the broad buy-in for the kind of work that we're trying to do. And we're working on three tools. I'm gonna to be talking today mostly about the housing need assessment tool. Uh, so a way to measure housing need and critically um, maximum costs um, across uh, realistic income categories, also including household sizes, including priority populations, including uh, net loss of affordable housing, including population growth. We also are developing land assessment tools that looks at um, how government and nonprofit land can be used for nonprofit housing. And we're also uh, developing a property acquisition tool uh, that uh, talks about how affordable housing can be preserved through acquisition. With the housing need assessment, we're using census data, um, 2016 data. We're gonna be updating it as of this week with 2021 data. Um, what are the maximum housing costs for five income categories? What's the existing deficit at each uh, of these categories, including what sizes of households and what priority populations are in need? Looking at net loss of affordable housing, for instance, right now between 2006 and 2016 at various price points. Looking at how quickly in every municipality, region, province, territory, and Canada as a whole, the population's growing because you can't just address the deficit, you also have to look at a growing population. And including that deficit, the net loss of affordable housing, I should say net change, but it's usually net loss and population growth. How much supply at what costs and sizes is needed, for instance, over a 10 year housing strategy? So the five income categories that we talk about are very low income, which is usually 20% or less of area median household income, low income families at or low income households, I should say, at um, uh, 20 to 50% moderate income households at 50 to 80 percent, average income households at 80 to 120 percent, and higher income households at over 121 percent. And this gives you a sense from the 2016 census of how the almost 1.7 million households in Canada break down by um, uh, income category. So to start off with very low income households, you'll see that it isn't a huge number, but these are households that are generally single person households that are very much at risk of homelessness. Why? Because they can afford a maximum of $353 per month for housing costs. These are generally households that are um, on social assistance um, or some other form of, um, uh, for instance, um, uh, disability pension. The next income category, which by far is the largest number of households in housing need, over a million, are low income households generally reliant on minimum wage. Again, when you look at what the maximum affordable housing cost is for them per month, it's $881. And I suppose you can tell me better than I would know, but I, I suspect there's not that much available in Greater Victoria right now, certainly um, uh, at a two bedroom or more um, size that uh, is $881 per month. Then there's a group of moderate income households who are um, uh, generally young professionals, key workers, et cetera, who can afford across Canada uh, $1,400 a month. And there you start getting to larger households that are in housing need, and that um, needs to be addressed because there isn't that much low cost housing for larger households. Even when you're looking at average income households, or in some cases, higher income households, they slip into core housing need because their um, vicinity is so unaffordable. When we start looking at priority populations, there's a lot we can glean from the census. There's also a lot that, again, the census leaves out. 
So we can definitely look at um, female lone parents who across Canada are the group that is most likely to be in housing need. And you can see that um, between 25 and 30% of um, uh, female lone parent households are in core housing need. Um, new migrants, particularly new migrants who are um, claiming refugee status are also extremely likely to be in core housing need. Um, Indigenous households are likely to be in housing need. There may well be undercounting of Indigenous households, including urban Indigenous households in the census. We know that um, uh, uh, people on um, reserve are uh, likely to be um, not uh, counted in core housing need. And we see that, for instance, Black households, female-led households, uh, households with various disabilities are also quite likely to be in core housing need, as are um, very young households and older households. So those are the kinds of priority populations that we're looking at, some of whom might have very specific needs um, that um, whose housing need needs to be met. So what are the policy implications? How can you even imagine a rent of 353 or it might be closer to 375 in Victoria because keep in mind that we're using the area median income. Well, some of the policy mechanisms that we're looking at and really they need to be stacked for rents that low is providing free leased land from government, scaling up nonprofit development, which is not only takes um, the profit off, but also stays cheaper over time, about a 25% um, less uh, cost of the rent over the first, uh, after the first 10 years. Uh, retaining existing affordable housing through mechanisms like acquisitions, rent control, and regulating short-term rental, uh, all of which can be done by provincial and municipal government, although an acquisitions program would really need some federal funding. And last but not least, zoning, particularly zoning to scale up affordable nonprofit development. That means ending exclusionary zoning of um, uh, single family residential, as of right developments of nonprofits, which is something that Victoria is leading the country on, ending parking restrictions, which can add up to $40,000 per parking spot. Um, so those are some of the ways to make uh, housing cheaper that really need to be scaled up. I just am including all of these slides will be available afterwards. Uh, about 4% of Canada's housing um, stock is um, not for profit. Um, there are many countries in the world where the proportion is much higher, where the um, build of new nonprofit housing is much, much higher. And really Canada should be looking to places like Finland, which went from about 4% to 11% um, in a fairly short period of time, where their focus on housing first has really come close to, um, it's certainly limited uh, homelessness and is coming close to eradicating homelessness. Um, that's about it for my presentation. I'll now hand it over to, Vic, uh, to Nicole to talk about the Victoria case study, and I'll be very happy to take questions after the two other panelists have spoken. So thank you very much. Thanks, Carolyn. Great job. I will, um, happy to see your policy solutions there. Uh, about how to main, get and maintain those low rents and that the, the first one was uh, free land from government. There's many candidates in our municipal election that are proposing to expand uh, and develop acquisition programs for public land. Okay, so here I am. Analytics to support the realization of housing for all in Greater Victoria. Um, let's just start with this title and this particular phrase, uh, the realization of housing for all, uh, which is actually, you know, kind of a bureaucratic mouthful. But in 2019, the Government of Canada passed the National Housing Strategy Act, which recognized the right uh, to housing in Canada. 
Uh, but more than that, it, it recognized that governments uh, have a responsibility to ensure progress is being made on realizing the right to housing for all in Canada. Uh, the word realizing is important here. Um, you, could, you could say actualizing. It doesn't mean that the government has to provide housing for all. It means that the government has to design interventions, policies, programs, or strategies that result in uh, housing for all, um, not just citizens, but everyone in Canada. And um, so uh, also um, the, in the same act, the government uh, committed to removing 530,000 households from housing need in Canada. So I, I just note that Carolyn uh, just told us that there's 1.7 million households in core housing need, and uh, the government's committed to removing 530,000 uh, from need. So there's an interesting uh, contradiction there. So anyways, what does what does data have to have to do with this? Everything. It's, it's really hard to make jokes on on Zoom, you know. Like, is anybody is anybody out there? Anyways, um, so this the CM, CMHC Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation. They have an aspiration that by 2030, every Canadian will be enjoying the right to housing. Uh, I've already mentioned that the federal government has said we're going to remove 530,000 households by 2029 from core housing need. And locally, the Greater Victoria Coalition to End Homelessness has recently renewed its commitment uh, to achieving something they call functional, something that is called functional zero homelessness, also by 2030. So um, functional zero homelessness, I'll just briefly tell you, it means it's a standardized measurement of homelessness in one's community. In plain language, it means that uh, homelessness is still occurring, but the experiences of homelessness are rare brief and they're not recurring. The, in technical terms, it's a, um, you, you measure uh, that fewer people are entering homelessness than are exiting. So you're measuring that more people are exiting homelessness at a faster rate than people are entering. When you've done that, uh, you've achieved something called functional zero homelessness, which is a milestone uh, on the pathway to ending absolute homelessness in this country. So, but anyways, the, the takeaway point for this presentation is that uh, the coalition, uh, which was created by local governments and is accountable to local governments and funded by local governments uh, and federal government, as well as major federal government institutions, CMHC, have all made a goal and commitments to ending homelessness or stated positively ensuring housing for all in Canada. So um, Carolyn uh, gave you the definition of core housing need, which is um, you know, a, a, a backbone of this an analysis that we do. Uh, I also wanna tell you that the Canadian Observatory of Homelessness in their definitions of homelessness uh, identifies core housing need as an indicator of households that are at risk of homelessness. So they do make a distinction between um, households at risk of homelessness and households at imminent risk of homelessness. And you can refer to the report that Diana referred to, Drivers of Homelessness, to learn more about that. You know, when, a, when an event like an eviction intersects with being in core housing need, you might find yourself at imminent risk of homelessness. So the point is that our local governments and national governments have committed to ending homelessness, but really until we have good data in place, like the uh, heart data proposed by Carolyn and her team, uh, we're just blindly walking towards or away from this goal. We really don't know. So we need good data for two reasons, to shape strategies, to design strategies that are nuanced towards the need but we need good data to know whether we're making progress towards these local and national goals uh, and whether or not these strategies are 
effective. So, this is the first part of the heart methodology. We tested this methodology uh, in five geographies in Victoria, Esquimalt, Saanich, Souk, the city of Victoria, and the uh, greater Victoria, the Victoria CMA, Census Metropolitan Area. And the data that I'm going to provide is, is just for the CMA, just for greater Victoria is what we're looking at. So when we take the methodology created by the heart team and apply it to the CMA. This is what we this is what we get. So one thing I'll repeat a few times uh, throughout the presentation uh, are the actual income brackets and the actual monthly affordable housing costs. Uh, somebody once told me you have to say things 26 times for an adult to remember them. So uh, you'll hear a repeated message over and over again. So the, the heart, just for just to give you one example about the variations of how low income is defined or how low and moderate income is defined uh, in our region and in our province. Um, about three years ago, I gave uh, a presentation uh, to a live audience, so I was able to get feedback immediately. And I asked uh, people what they thought uh, low the term low income meant. And so most people thought it meant somebody on social assistance. And the audience was very surprised to learn that there has housing analysts and strategists have created an income bracket below low income. <laughs> and I can tell that the media doesn't know that there's an income bracket below low income in their media stories, because uh, they're constantly referring to low income without recognizing that there's another income bracket, very low income. So uh, one thing for you guys to know is that um, a person on social assistance uh, in the Greater Victoria is going to be in the very low income bracket if they're on regular social assistance. And if they're on what's called PWD, persons with disabilities, they're just, just above the cutoff. And so they have landed in our low income bracket. Um, this, this is what BC Housing calls their housing income limits. So for Victoria, a one bedroom house, uh, uh, the maximum amount of income you can earn to rent a BC housing unit is $47,500. So, but in reality, the usually a nonprofit that's operating that housing, they're, they're also going to come up with a minimum income requirement so that they can make sure they have enough revenues to cover their costs. So they might, they might need to say, it, it'll vary, but they might need to say, you need to earn a minimum of $35,000 uh, to rent this one bedroom house. So just keeping that in mind, we go back to our income categories and we'll see you know, uh, a household that's earning $47,500 is in, is in the heart methodology, moderate income uh, bracket. So they're not low income or very low income. They would be in moderate income. So the question is, does it really matter uh, if, you know, in the Victoria, uh, greater Victoria, very low income is defined as households earning less than 15,000 and households uh, with low incomes uh, defined and households with low incomes is de are defined as earning between 15 and 35,000, where BC housing has a different de definition of uh, low income housing, or maybe, maybe it doesn't matter. But this slide, the first slide that we come up with in our analysis shows us that it matters very much. Uh, very low income and low income households in greater Victoria are disproportionately um, experiencing uh, housing need. 
So let's tuck into that for a little bit. This is the housing deficit by income bracket. Some uh, housing strategies in the region include housing def deficits or call them latent demand in their strategies and some do not. The Hart prototype uh, and our report is recommending that all immediate housing needs are included uh, in uh, housing needs analysis. So what we see here is that using 2016 census data, we know that there's 14, about 14,205 homes that cost between 375 and 874 a month. So let's just contemplate that for a minute. So most of the need here, our data tells us, is for one or two person homes. And we know that about, uh, on average, 1.8 people live uh, in a household in Victoria. So it's a little more than 14,205 people. Uh, it's, that's 14,205 households. We could say it's 19, we could just say it's 19,000 people. This data, by the way, uh, is, is old data. And it's great for discussion purposes. And it's great for um, getting a sense of the scope of the problem. But it's really the 2021 data uh, that uh, Diana and the council are going to crunch when it's available. That's going to give you uh, more actionable and, and precise information. So this is this what we did here is a test, and this is a test for discussion, and this is a test to see if the methodology works. But it is also telling us uh, a story. So 14,205 households, uh, 19, 20,000 people. Uh, putting that into context, so that's if if we're if we were standing in front of uh, the Royal Theatre. Uh, and it was full, and it was just people in core housing need. Well, that's uh, way that's not a big enough uh, venue to hold all of the people in Greater Victoria. Uh, Starlight Stadium. Nod to my alma mater in Lankford. There, Starlight Stadium uh, can only hold about six thousand people, so that's not big enough to hold everybody who's waiting for affordable housing. Uh, in just the low income bracket in Victoria. Memorial, same thing, only holds 7,000 people. We have to go to Vancouver and we have to rent Rogers Arena and, then, and put every single person who, who's in the low income bracket, who's paying more than 30% of their, of their income on rent. Uh, that's how, that's the scale of the, the existing immediate deficit or latent demand uh, that we're trying to grapple with. So uh, by the way, so the HART team, the community social planning team and the Canada BC expert panel on supply recommends that uh, housing needs reports and housing strategies address immediate existing deficits. So that would be a change going forward. So the HART methodology uh, uh, is, provides a straightforward way to look at housing deficits by income bracket, which we uh, have done, and by household size. So what you're looking at here, I'll just give you a second. Uh, it's all in the report so you can study it. Uh, you know, the light pink is showing us a huge demand for one person homes or one person households are the ones that are more likely to be in core housing need. And the darker maroon color is next, uh, two person households and so on and so on. So without a doubt, looking at this, we can see right away that it's low income one person households uh, that are in the, in the, have the greatest shortfall. This slide is looking at our, and Carolyn showed a very similar slide. This slide is for greater Victoria. And it's telling us the percent of priority populations who are in housing need. And we see right away disproportionately female lone parent households 
uh, have a much greater likelihood of being in core housing need. One in, if you're a female lone parent household, you have a one in three chance of living in housing that doesn't meet national housing standards. If you're in an indigenous household, you have a one in five chance of living in a house that does not meet national housing standards. So in our analysis, we decided to uh, look, to dive deep as a test uh, into one of the priority populations. And we chose female lone parents um, because for two reasons. One, they're in the awkward position of having one income, but needing to spend more on housing because they need more than one bedroom and because uh, they're disproportionately impacted by this. This is why I included this slide right here <laughs> to show you that BC housing increases the income limit uh, as they increase the bedroom size. So this obviously has an equity impact for uh, female lone parent households who are not able to increase their income despite needing more bedrooms. So the big takeaway here is that the greatest need for female-led lone parent families is for two and three bedroom homes that cost between $375 and $874 every month. Okay, projections. Projections, very, very politicized these days, and, and that's okay. Uh, I don't wanna take up uh, really too much time talking about methodology. The report has a very clear, very transparent section on methods and also limitations. But it's important to just mention methodology, uh, especially when we're talking about projections, because projections are based on past trends. And uh, there's no reason why uh, what we did in the past is what we're going to do in the future. Uh, so the projections, they're always inaccurate. That's what I have to say about projections. They're always inaccurate because they're based on past trends, uh, but they do tell us a, a sense of what a possible future could look like. And especially, uh, municipal governments are so close to people that um, the, the projections sh should be enhanced with local knowledge to, to get a uh, more refinement, particularly households that are in core housing need. So the way we did, I'll show you the projections, that, uh, some projections for the greater Victoria. So the way that we did projections, we're very lucky in British Columbia because BC Stats uh, has a household projection app. And so they base this on a pretty sophisticated population projection model called uh, People, Population Extrapolation for Organizational Planning with Less Error. Anyways, good acronym. Uh, it takes into account out migration and migration, aging demographics and such. So, and it, uh, it was available for this geography, uh, census metropolitan areas, uh, when we did our study, and it will be av available for census subdivisions in October. So for the municipal folks there, uh, you're going to have access to uh, a, a very reliable household projection app from BC Stats uh, starting next month, which is good timing with the housing theme, theme census release. So here we are, Victoria CMA expected to grow by 45,395 households from 2016 to 2026, our study period. Uh, higher income households are expected to grow for, more, for all household sizes, except one person households. And one person households are anticipated to grow the most in the low income category. I suspect this is because of um, seniors in our area.
This is the um, same information presented as a table. No, it's not, sorry. This is, okay. This is the same information as presented as the table, but I'm gonna show you the table in a minute. So the heart method uh, proposes that you take uh, all of the housing deficit in your community plus housing losses and projected, sorry, projected housing losses with projected housing need uh, to come up with something called total projected housing need. Now, we did not, there were lots of problems with the data uh, to come up with housing losses uh, or housing redistributions in Greater Victoria. So we didn't include that. So this should be thought of as a conservative estimate of total projected housing need. Also the data uh, the next time around is much better. So I, the Community Social Planning Council and municipal governments will be able to calculate and project uh, housing losses uh, with using 2021 and 2016 census data. So total amount of projected housing need to 2026 in our region over the 10 year study period, almost 70,000 uh, households. And it was surprising to me, but the, the majority of the need is coming from that deficit. One person, low income homes. So this is the same information here. I think that uh, the, the, it's reasonable to assume that if there's no big changes in overarching social and economic policy, then it is also reasonable to project total housing need uh, as the heart prototype does. Uh, so uh, for example, there are, we don't have any indications right now from provincial or federal governments that there will be a change in structural supports for very low and low income households. Structural supports is either income or housing. So it's my professional opinion that total housing need will look like this in 2026, assuming business as usual to structural supports in Victoria. So the greatest need in our region, just to really hammer this home, Households with low income, income incomes between 15,000 and 35,000 per year. Rents between 375 and 874 per year. So concluding thoughts, affordability significantly, significantly more acute for low income households in Greater Victoria. The numbers, the specific numbers are uh, far less important than the enormity and the scale of the challenge. The numbers in this report should be a wake up call to everyone. Canadian Mortgage Housing Corporation recently completed economic modeling that concluded we need a 24% increase in current housing starts in British Columbia to achieve a target affordability of $607,000 for the average Canadian household. The report the, the authors wisely, in my view, did not suggest that filtering or trickle-down housing would solve low-income housing needs. Instead, it argued that it needed to do finer grained analysis across income brackets to yield insights on how much social housing is required. So this heart methodology fills that gap and need for finer grained analysis. The next question for CMHC is how much what kind of supply is required to restore affordability for approximately 20,000 low income households in Greater Victoria by 2030? Our analysis shows the viability and importance for municipal governments to project total housing need by income bracket and by household size, and to also include intersectional analysis. The methodology showed the viability of articulating maximum affordable rents and household sizes for priority populations. I notice that the Make Housing Central campaign is currently asking municipal candidates to pledge to include specific housing targets for Indigenous households. And the Heart methodology provides the evidence to base those targets upon. Housing needs assessments that don't disaggregate data 
by income and by other equity lenses contribute to systemic underfunding of suitable and adequate in interventions, which reinforces inequality. To wrap up, CMHC, Government of Canada, local governments and our coalition to end homelessness have affirmed the right to housing. We're committed to ending homelessness. This analysis is a straightforward, easy way to track progress towards or regression from the goal of affordable housing for all. Thank you, Nicole. We have a technical question, um, but I think we'll we'll move to Luna um, for some brief a brief response um, before we jump into questions. Luna, hi. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me, and thank you, Nicole and Dr. Weitzman. You guys are both amazing, um, and very well-spoken, educated woman, which I love to see. Um, I've grown up in Victoria, and I often point to the housing needs reports as um, data behind the advocacy work that we try and do with encouraging more housing in the area. Um, I was very excited for the heart method report because it better examines and standardizes income brackets and provides key data on which equity seeking groups are most affected by the housing crisis. Um, I think this is really important to ensure that we are meeting the community requirements and creating the housing that is most needed. Um, one of the demographics examined is female-led lone parents. In the 90s, I was born at Vic General um, shortly after my birth father left. Um, we briefly stayed in my Nana's basement and my mother was able to get a one bedroom apartment that is still there in Rocklands. She didn't have a high school diploma and she worked at McDonald's making around $7 an hour in the 90s. If we had been in today's housing context, I don't think we would have made it. The Heart methodology takes an important approach to tracking equity seeking groups, such as my mother, um, that are living in adequate housing in the region so that we can better serve them by supplying the housing needed. During the last few years with the pandemic, the opioid and death epidemic and the ongoing housing crisis, my thoughts have often gone to those experiencing abuse. The periods of isolation, as well as the lack of available and affordable housing alternatives have really created this overwhelming, hard to escape situation. Recently at a public hearing, a young woman spoke on how she had been living with an ex, even though had, they had split up more than a year ago, due to the inability to afford alternative housing. She pointed out that though she was stuck living with her ex, she was thankful he was not abusive. This resonates close to home for me because after high school, I left an abusive home. This was more than six years ago, but the housing market at this time was increasing to where it is now boiling over. Um, to me back then, I thought the rent was high. I was in college classes and working two jobs in the restaurant industry and minimum wage was 1025. I'm very, very grateful and thankful that my friend's family took me in and saw what I was going through as they later did to another friend of ours and I was able to escape that situation. I really can't imagine where we would be if we had been going through that in today's housing market. Um, even though my experience was difficult, um, we're even in a worse experience now with the vacancy rate chronically below 1% and rent even higher. Um, now, as my friends and I start our professional careers and meet partners, get married, have kids, it becomes increasingly clear that Victoria has created a housing market which excludes young families, especially those with low income. Our chronically low vacancy rate, which declines even further to 0.8% for two bedroom units, and even further to 0.5% for units under 1400. 
I really appreciate that the Heart methodology acknowledges the need for housing strategies to address current deficits, as well as look to the future. Um, another important aspect is the loss of affordable housing, which Nicole mentioned. Um, due to our zoning constrictions, it's my belief that we lose a lot of affordable housing because we only allow housing to be built where already dense housing exists. So we're seeing apartments torn down to make room for new apartments that are more expensive because they are brand new, but they can't go anywhere else. Victoria is an incredibly challenging time, which has only been growing worse. I hope that with this better understanding of those most in need and with actual strategies and measurable progress, we can better help our communities and move forward with actionable solutions. Housing needs reports are incredible sources of data for our municipalities and advocates, but they need to be better acted upon by our governments. This is not something that we are able to drag our feet on as we are already working from a position of a huge housing deficit and significant action needs to be taken now to prevent the housing crisis to continue to grow in the years to come. It's really tough because I know people and I myself am struggling now. And I know that we really need to get acting on this. I hope that with the standardization and improvement of methodology, our governments can better understand and really act on this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Luna. That really sums it up um, with such a touching personal um, story and brings it home. Uh, I'll take questions now. Um, people feel free to throw questions into the chat. And um, I'll start with um, somebody asked uh, if the, how you integrated future growth projections into the housing need total, Nicole. Yeah, it's uh, it's actually straightforward. It's you take total housing deficit uh, plus projected losses, but we didn't do that in our version, plus projected need. Okay. Um, and I think Sarah had a follow-up question on that. Hi, Nicole. Yeah, um, just on, I wonder how you, sorry for the in-depth methodology questions we just kind of went through this with our own housing needs reports. So I'm curious how other folks dealt with this. Um, what did you do in terms of the income bands for the future growth projections? What were your assumptions? Yeah, we assumed that they would stay the same. So you so assumed that new people will have the same incomes as existing people? Uh, we assume that the same proportion of households would be in each income bracket. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. We struggled with that assumption and what to decide. So it, it sort of uh, ended yeah. up not, not using anything for that reason. Um, but it's interesting to see where folks went. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah. I think that's why it's best to, you know, take projections with a grain of salt um, and connect with households uh, to re to get more precise, but also like not be married to having perfect data because there's no such thing as perfect data. Okay, and somebody's asked a question, can it ask anyone address the issue of occupancy and a lack of availability for multi generational families, especially in BC housing. Uh, the BC uh, Association of Interval Houses has recently published a really good report. I'll try to drop the link into the chat about um, the fact that the national occupancy standards are kind of problematic. A lot of uh, single moms, particularly Indigenous single moms, find themselves in a catch-22. They lose custody of children, at least partly because um, they don't have uh, adequate housing, and then they find it hard to find that adequate housing without children uh, or with children, but particularly when they've lost custody and then they find it very difficult to regain uh, custody. So um, there, we, we know uh, that there is a huge amount of unmet demand, as Nicole said, for very low cost, larger units. And that definitely needs to be a priority. 
Um, I'm recognizing that we're we're close to the time. I think that this has been um, scheduled till 2.30. We are able to continue for a few minutes after because it was um, we've had so little time for discussion. We can add another 10 minutes. But for the people that have to go, I just want to quickly thank um, the speakers and everybody for attending today, um, particularly Luna for sharing personal story. I know it's really challenging, but it's so important to bring that, to, you know, to land things on the ground. And certainly um, the um, Social Planning Council's grant bank program is seeing a lot of women fleeing violence and the, the same populations that are identified in the drivers of homelessness, showing that discrimination is a factor in um, core housing need and in housing um, access. So the, the heart methodology from our perspective, the, the, the intersectionality of that and the fact that there is clearly in the data today um, a distinction between the experiences of different populations in housing need that um, that intersectionality and this standardization is a critical piece for moving forward on uh, planning so thank you everybody who joined today and who's been able to present with us and for to nicole for all the work on digging in and carolyn for supporting the methods um, so and we will move into further questions for another 10 minutes for those who can stay on Okay, so um, oh, there's a few questions coming in around, I'm gonna have to go back. Um, the issue of nonprofit housing organizations redeveloping buildings that were geared to income when built. Um, there's a potential for thousands of seniors to become homeless over the next decade. Um, are folks considering this in the data? So that would be loss of existing housing. <clears throat> I'm just going to go ahead and answer a couple of the questions. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, one of the, from Heather is a really interesting one. I think we'll know tomorrow what the 2021 housing need data looks like. It's being released tomorrow, Heather. And one of the idiosyncrasies is that the data was collected in May of 2020 when CERB had just kicked in, which means that we may see uh, an improvement in core housing need, particularly with very poor families or poor households that um, saw their incomes go up between social assistance and serve. Um, but we're going to have to see tomorrow. My fearless prediction is that we're going to see more moderate income housing um, uh, need, but we may not see very low income housing need increase. We certainly won't see um, a big improvement, unfortunately, because um, the Canadian government has not done enough. Um, okay. And just to respond to Nicola, the short term actions, I mean, you've got an election coming up. So the short term actions are uh, if you have a housing um, uh, coalition, and it sounds like Luna is involved with uh, Homes um, for Living, um, make sure that candidates are um, uh, responding to it, endorsing it. And I think Homes for Living is doing some work in that area. Um, somebody asked, uh, rents have increased hugely in the last two to three years. Do you expect a large increase in housing need in the 2021 statistics? Carolyn or Nicole. Well, I mean, I, like Carolyn mentioned, it's it's weird because it was collected, it, the census was collected um, when people were receiving CERB. So we would actually see mm -hmm. uh, a drop in core housing need in lower income groups, but I would not be surprised if core housing need, uh, you know, stretches into uh, more severely into moderate mm -hmm. and average income brackets. Yeah. And that would line up with what we're seeing at the rent bank in terms of households coming in that are at risk of eviction due to a one-time crisis that don't have any kind of cushion and it is creep those those incomes are, are creeping up okay um there's some other questions that we haven't answered here um there there was some uh, mention around the quality of census data and lack of adequate census data around um uh, reserve uh, Indigenous data particularly has major gaps and has always been, in, you know, a, a challenge for um, uh, data quality. So I don't know if either of you want to speak to that. There are at least five huge gaps in core housing need that Statistics Canada needs to address. Um, one of them, and I think Matt Thompson just um, made a discussion about that or a chat uh, mention about that. 
there are low rates of return in um, indigenous communities and in communities whose first language isn't English. So I'm absolutely certain that we're um, underestimating core housing need. There's also a lot of um, illegal rooming houses and congregate housing in general isn't included in housing need, but certainly if people are renting illegally, I very much doubt that people are filling out census forms. Um, a third huge gap, uh, certainly in Ottawa, uh, is um, not including students in core housing needs. So the um, deficit in Ottawa is about 50,000 households, but when you look at students, there's 100,000 households, over half of them come from out of Ottawa in order to study. Um, at the large universities in Ottawa, and only about 10% of them are covered in student housing. And even in student housing, the costs, because it generally is privately um, provided, are incredibly high. So um, someone said depressing statistics. Can I just say, you don't know the half of it. Um, it uh, we really need to start being serious about counting uh, homelessness, congregate housing, students, um, et cetera, in um, our, our discussion of core housing need. And, and in response to Heather, there's absolutely no way that you can uh, provide housing on any kind of sustainable basis for 375 a month. So um, the, the, biggest, the biggest immediate thing that BC housing could do is raise um, shelter allowance rates and raise minimum wage. Yeah, there's um, two sides too, of course, to um, housing need. One is income and the other is housing, um, housing supply and cost. So definitely two ways to tackle that problem and, and not enough focus on the income. Certainly with 30% of the people in homelessness on disability pensions, there's room to move on that side. Um, I think we'll wrap up now with the um, public event. Um, I, I, Heather asked how much do shelter rates like, need to be raised. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to answer that right away. We do have um, a campaign coming forward through the council that's looking at the, the shelter rate gap um, and uh, advocating for a change in shelter rates to address housing need. So that you can watch for that to be coming um, sometime in the near future. I could also just add that in our last report uh, that uh, we did with Diana, the drivers of homelessness, we uh, reported that using Canada's official poverty line, which is the market basket measure, and the most recent one was 2019, so it's already out of date, uh, 20, about 20,000 per year is the official poverty line for uh, a single house, single person household in Victoria. And PWD, persons with disability, social assistant rate is about $13,000 per year. So raising the so all social assistance to the official poverty line and indexing it to cost of living increases would be something more just. Uh, to be to begin with but right now if you are like newly diagnosed with schizophrenia or newly diagnosed with MS or something that puts you on to PWD you can't rent an apartment in Victoria the total the total forget shelter since the total your total income is less than the median available rent so it's 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 time to go it's it's urgent like now is when <laughs> it's like, yes, not yesterday it's so so bad all right. Diana, may, I, may I make a suggestion for a follow-up session like this? We've dealt with demand and supply. Why don't we have a session on the cost of building new construction units of a low-income nature and the amount of subsidy per unit required? I think that's a part of the missing equation. You've done a great job on need, uh, but the price end of it and the amount of subsidy per unit and people getting their head around that is really important. So thank you very much today from Mick Collins. Thank you. All right, well, we're gonna wrap up, um, this wraps up the public session. And uh, I wanna again, thank everybody for attending for the fantastic discussion. Um, this is a discussion paper. So we're, we're always open to more conversation around this. So if you have, um, if you wanna have more discussions, reach out to us um, and um, you can always email um, our contact information is on our website. Um, 
And if you're interested in further further engagement and discussions, we're, um, we're super happy to. There are two sessions coming up from the Community Social Planning Council to be aware of. Um, on the 28th, at, we'll do a lunch and learn around um, uh, displacement and tenant protections. And uh, one of the big challenges um, we saw in the missing middle debate was people being concerned about tenant um, displacement and that may be impeding um, movement forward on housing zoning. And so we wanted to engage more deeply on the ability to do tenant protections while increasing affordable supply. Um, and then there's another one on October 3rd that we're not sponsoring, but we're participating in around safety and community well-being. And um, with the, the Planning Council participating on the panel with lived experience perspective on community safety. So watch for those in our emailers and um, social media. And thanks again, everybody, for participating. Thank you so much to the speakers.